This video is like a special edition. I teamed up with someone to create a Svelte course on Udemy and as part of that course I'm building a project from scratch. I re-recorded the process of building that project with a little bit different way of explaining the details. That's what you're watching now. If this makes you feel like purchasing the Svelte course, you can find an affiliate link to it in the description. If not, that's totally fine. Whatever. Let's get started. The project is called Fun Fact Feed. This on the screen is almost the final version, final enough to have an impression what it is about. Here in the middle there are random facts, periodically fetched using an API. Every time a new fact arrives to the top, the last one on the bottom disappears. And here on the left side there is a settings section where I can change the amount of the facts to be displayed, the frequency of the requests in seconds, and a start-stop button that poses the requests. If I click on it, then the fact list won't be refreshed until I click again and then it will restart. When I said almost final version, I meant that after reaching this stage, this here, I'm going to add a little more styling to it and right now all the facts are coming from the same server. Right now these are all facts related to cats. I want to add a bit more variety to it by finding additional free APIs to diversify my wisdom. Super quickly, what is Svelte? Many Google results say that it's a component-based open source UI framework like React or Angular, although Rich Harris, the creator of Svelte himself, calls it a language instead with the attempt for describing reactive user interfaces. Wikipedia, on the other hand, calls Svelte a front-end compiler and that's a reasonable description since what happens behind the scenes when your app is being built, Svelte translates your code into plain JavaScript in build time. Which is a different approach from the runtime interpretation used by React for example. What React does is it keeps the representation of the document object model, the DOM, in the memory as an object and keeps updating the real DOM based on that. And that happens in runtime. If you don't understand some of these expressions, no need to stress. This process is running in the background. This is just some additional info. And the point is that this is the kind of novelty for Svelte that helps the apps to load faster and have a better overall performance. Okay, let's get started and build the default Hello World app in Svelte. Step zero is to make sure that you have Node installed. If you don't, head over to nodejs.org and download the current long-term support version. Install it. Then if you type node-v in your terminal and the final result is a version number, then you're good to go. Then it's time to check on the Svelte homepage, svelte.dev, what commands to copy and paste into your terminal. First, clone the Svelte Git repository into a local folder. I call it FFF, which is a highly intelligent abbreviation for fun fact feed. Once that's done, I enter that folder, cd FFF, and then npm install will install the necessary npm packages that might take a while, but just be patient. And if the packages are successfully installed, npm run dev will first compile the file, as you may remember, into plain JavaScript, and finally it runs on port 5000. If I check out localhost 5000 in the browser, this is how the default Svelte app looks like at the moment. It keeps changing, so don't be shocked if you see something different. If I check the file structure in the VS Code, the starting point is the app.svelte file in the source folder. The .svelte extension in the file name suggests that this app is a component, a reusable self-contained block of code that encapsulates HTML for the document structure, CSS for styling, and JavaScript for the component states and functions that belong together. And the project I'm about to build will be made of components like this. Now, before going any further, I want to plan the structure of the project because yeah, that's one thing that it will be built of components. The real question is what each of these components are supposed to do and how they need to be connected with each other. And this is something that can be understood even without knowing any Svelte. This is just explaining what the building blocks of the project should do. 
in order to end up with the app I showed in the beginning. There are several different ways for that, not just the one I chose, but this one worked for me, so I kept it. So this is more or less how the UI will look like. This is the main component and it will have two child components. One will be the settings component on the left side where the user can change the amount of the facts, the fetch rate and can stop and restart the feed. And then here on the right side will be the feed itself. That will be another child component of the app, meaning that it will be used inside of the app component and it will contain the list of the fact components. So the fact components will be the children of the feed component. Each of the facts, the sentences, will belong to one instance of the fact component and how many of them will be inside of the feed component that depends on the value set in the settings component. Okay, that's four components so far. Now let's change the point of view and look at the structure of these components. The main component, which is called app by default, it will have two children, the settings on one side and the feed on the other side. And the feed component will have several instances of the fact component. Next question, how will these components communicate with each other? How does the feed component know what are the values of the amount and refresh rate variables in the settings component? And how do the fact components receive the sentence they have to display from their parent component, the feed? As for reading the settings components while used by the feed component, I will create a so-called Svelte store. Stores allow to read and write variables that can be accessible by any component in the app. So the settings component will write in the store and the feed component will read from it. And for passing down data from the parent component to the child component, like passing the sentences from the feed component to the fact component, there is the concept of properties or props, where in the parent component, the child component's custom tag can get an attribute with the value of the data I want to pass. I will go through these things step by step to show how to use them, but it's definitely a benefit to have an idea in advance what components I will need and how are they supposed to work together to get the app I want at the end as the final result. So let's go back to the code editor and start implementing the plan. Big question, where to start? If your plan is proper, that it doesn't affect the final result, what is the first component you start working on? And let's assume that my plan is proper and I personally would like to start with the settings component. Creating a component in Svelte is creating a new file with .svelte extension. I call it settings.svelte and place it right to the source folder where the app component is. In order to put these two components in parent-child relation, I need to import settings from settings.svelte between the script tags. And once it's imported, I can use a self-closing custom tag with the component's name, settings, outside of the script tag. So let's just replace these two lines with settings. Now the whole settings component will be rendered to this spot, but since the settings component is totally blank, I won't see anything. Luckily, Svelte components don't require any boilerplate code. I can simply put a heading inside saying feed settings and it's working fine. So this is how to create a new Svelte component and how to create a parent-child relationship between them. Next, I make the settings component to allow actually setting some values. I will have two inputs with the range type so that I can change the values with a horizontal slider and a button which will toggle between true and false values if I click on it. Creating a variable in a Svelte component happens the same way as in JavaScript with the let keyword, except that here all the JavaScript code has to be inside of script tags, which is usually on the top of the file. Here I initialize three variables one for each part of the settings, amount, how many facts do I want in the feed, refresh, how many seconds I want the interval between fetchings to be, and active, which represents if the feed keeps being refreshed or just stays still. Under the heading, as I said, I want a slider to modify the amount and refresh values, for which I need inputs with range type, 
I set minimum and maximum values to both of them and also create a label for them where the amount and the refresh rate value will be displayed. Now, how can I make sure that the value of the input element is synchronized with the variable defined in the component? That moving this thing here on the slider means changing the value of a specific variable and vice versa, the change of the variable results this thingy being repositioned. This what I just described is called two-way data binding and in Svelte it can be used by adding the bind keyword to an input attribute, like so, binding the value and for this first input I want to bind it to the amount variable and the other one to the refresh variable. And to complete the settings, I add the button down below, which will toggle the active value between true and false when clicked. And if the active is true, the button text will be stop feed, otherwise it will be start feed. Let's check all these values, if they are changing according to the plan. And as far as I can judge, they do indeed. The settings values are now changing inside of the settings component but they need to be shared with the feed component as well. If feed is the settings child, I could use props to pass down the data on the component tree. I will show how that works later, but this is not the case now. As you might remember, they are now siblings. So instead of using props, I'm going to create a store, which I can use for different components all across my app to have access to the variables stored in it. All I need to do to use a store is first creating a new file with .js extension, feedstore.js. Then I import writable from sweat slash store. This way I define the type of the store. Writable means that components can both read and write from and to the store. I define a new variable, feedstore, which equals the writable method with an object as its argument. And that object will include all the three settings values as key value pairs amount will be initialized as 5, refresh as 8, and active as true. And step number 3, after importing writable and defining the initial object, I export the store with export default feed store. And this is now a fully functional Svelte store that can be used by any of the components in the app. And how exactly can I use it in the settings component? First of all, I need to import it from wherever I saved the .js file. This time they are in the same folder. After that, to read from a store, there is a really simple way for that. Instead of these hard-coded values, I can use a dollar sign, then the name of the store, and then whatever property of the object defined in the store. So that here would be amount, then refresh, and then stop. Quick check in the browser. Are the starting values the same as defined in the object? Yes, they are. I can still modify the settings values, but that will only affect the local variables in the settings component. So far, I only use the store to give the local variables an initial value. If I want these values to be saved in the store, there is a special method called update I can use on the feed store. This method takes the current store values as its argument, let's call it current settings, and then I can use the current values of the object. For example, I can reassign them to the local amount, refresh and stop values that I have in the settings component. And at the end, if I return with the modified current settings object, this object with the new values will be set in the store. That's it for the update method. And one last quite important detail. When do I want this update method to run? every time any of the three settings values change. So does that mean now that I need to add something like an on change attribute to each of these inputs and buttons and call the update from there? Luckily, no. I can use a so-called reactive statement, a really convenient Svelte functionality. If I want a function to be called anytime any of the variables that are used in it are reassigned anywhere in the component, I simply make that function reactive. And all I need for that is a dollar sign and a colon in front of the function, like this. And now that the update is reactive, every time I change the amount, refresh or stop variables, their new value will be placed in the store. And if that's hard to believe, just because I say so, let's create the feed component, a new .svelte file. 
where all I do is import the feed store from feedstore.js. This must be again inside of script tags. And then I can read the store values just like I did in the settings component with the dollar sign feed store dot amount refresh and active properties. Each of them will be displayed in an HTML heading. Okay, then I hop over to the app component where this feed component will be imported, making it the app's child component. And I want this to be rendered below the settings. Now let's see the browser again. On the top, there is the settings component displaying the values of the component's local amount, refresh and active values. And every time I change the values, the update method in the settings writes those values in the feed store. And below I can see that the feed component reads those values from the store and displays them, which is great. This means that now the feed component is aware of the settings and is ready to act accordingly. I will start by creating sample sentences instead of immediately fetching real world fun facts. I will use APIs only when the functionality seems to be correct. According to the plan from the beginning, the facts will be fetched in the feed component and will be passed down one by one as props to the child, to the fact component. Let's start it simple and pass down a sentence to just one single fact component that can serve as a demonstration on how to handle props. So let's create a new component, fact.svelte. Inside of script tags, define a fact variable as sample sentence. And under the script tags, there will be a paragraph displaying the value of the fact variable. In the feed component, the fact component will be imported. So from now on, feed is a proud parent. And I replace these headings to one single self-closing fact tag. So far, I didn't do anything new, just created a component and called it from the parent component. Now, what's the issue with props? If I have a data I want to pass down to the child component, for example, I define a fact variable here with the same value, sample sentence, then I can add the custom attribute to the fact tag. Let's call it fact prop. And the value of the attribute will be the fact variable. And in the child component, if I'm expecting props from the parent, then I use the export keyword before defining the variable with let. The name of this variable is the same as the name of the attribute used in the parent component. And then whatever value was used as the value of the fact prop attribute in the feed component, that will be the value of the fact prop variable in the fact component. Now I am using this fact prop variable as a property. The result looks the same as before, but now different instances of the fact component can have different fact prop values, depending on what they receive from the feed component. And let's just do that. Let's have several instances of the fact component, each of them having different props. This here will be a facts array of three sentences, and to be able to distinguish between the different sentences, I will use random numbers in it. A random integer between 0 and 99 is a nice number. And then I want to iterate through this array, and I want each of the three sentences to be passed down to a fact component as props. And I could use the fact tag three times after each other using the facts arrays three elements. But in Swell, there is a built in syntax to iterate through an iterable object like the array. And that works with the curly brackets, hashtag, each, array name, s, and then whatever name I want to give to the individual elements, fact. That sounds accurate. And the end of the iteration is noted by curly bracket, forward slash, each, and then closing bracket. Now in every iteration, a fact component will be rendered with the value of the given array's current element as props. Plus if I use these fact components inside of a list, each one as an element of an ordered list, I don't need to bother with the numbering. Next to this each, the other commonly used logical method in Svelte is the conditional statement if, if else and else. Let's test this as well. If the amount is larger than 9, then instead of the amount value, I display too many sentences to display. Else, if it's smaller than 4, then display too little amount of sentences. And if none of those are true, then the original heading will be displayed. 
And just like the each loop, I have to close the if statement at the end as well. Okay, let's see what the browser is showing. Here are the three fact components, each of them with their own sentences. And if I set the amount to 10, that's too large, 3 is too small, the other values are okay. So yeah, using these built-in Svelte conditional expressions and iteration inside of the HTML block of a component, that's really something that can be useful sometimes. Okay, it's time to move on to the functionality, which is safe to say that it's the key step. I want that the amount of facts in the feed component moves together with the amount value in the settings component, that the refresh rate of the feed changes with the refresh value displayed in the settings component, and that clicking on the stop button pauses the feed until it gets clicked again. First, let me go to the app component and in the styling section, I get rid of the H1 selector and this text align property. That's all the change in the stylings for now. I will come back to styling later after the app works properly. So I want a series of comments to be executed whenever a specific value, in this case the amount value, changes. And I can use a reactive statement again for that, like I did for the store update, that we run every time the variables inside of it have been reassigned. If the amount is increased, I keep adding new elements to the facts array until I have enough. If it's decreased, I want to keep deleting the last elements until I have as many as set in the settings. I made a simple picture about the four related array methods. If I have an array with A, B, C and D elements, pop removes the last element, push adds a new element to the end, shift removes the first element from the beginning, and unshift pushes a new element to the beginning. Note that these are not reassigning the array, they are just mutating it, which will be important soon. So which ones do I need here? I want to add elements to the end, not to the beginning, so I pick push, and I want to delete from the end as well, so I pick pop for that. Feel free to use the other ones if you prefer, that's completely fine. Now I don't know in the reactive statement if the amount has been increased or decreased, only that it has changed, so I have to prepare for both cases, and I do that with two while loops, while the effects array's length is smaller than the amount value in the feed store, keep pushing empty elements to its end, and then, while the facts array's length is larger than the amount value, keep deleting the last elements from it. Now, no matter if the amount value has been increased or decreased, the number of the elements in the fact array will match with it. Okay, now let's see if this is working now. I change the amount in the settings, and, and nothing happens. So what went wrong? This is now a problem about the array methods being mutable. They do what you saw on the picture, but they only mutate the array without reassigning, and without reassigning, the reactive statement is not executing. There are two ways to solve this issue. You could either manually reassign the array by simply making it equal to either itself, like this, or with a spread operator, like this. As you can see, that would be fine or you can replace these methods with immutable alternatives, and that's what I will do. Instead of pushing an element in the fact array, I make it equal to all its elements with the spread operator, plus an empty element at the end. And as for replacing the pop, I make it equal to all its elements, except for the last one, for which I can use the slice method. And this implementation does what you might already expected earlier, this difference between mutating and reassigning the arrays and also the objects, that can be quite confusing in JavaScript, but now you should be aware that this issue exists. Great, the array length is now changing according to the amount value. Now how to do a refresh rate? There are two ways for calling a function repeatedly, and I made a picture for that as well. So there are two functions set interval which takes a function and a number, and it keeps calling the function in every whatever is the number milliseconds. This example here displays hello every second. Set timeout, on the other hand, waits this many milliseconds, and then executes the function once. However, this here is a nested timeout, which keeps calling the function it's inside of. So this here ends up displaying hello every second as well, whenever you call the function once. 
I could use both of these versions, but there is a small difference between them that is worth to know about. The implementation with the set interval will call the function exactly every 100 or 1000 millisecond, whatever is set, even if the execution takes a while, which is a real possibility for fetching from an API. And what the nested set timeout does is it starts counting the milliseconds after the lines above are all executed. This difference won't be notable for the case of this console.log, but it will be a visible difference for fetching from a remote server. So it's up to you which one do you choose. At the end I went with the set interval version because I didn't want to wait too long for an API that takes a while to respond, but I still thought that the nested timeout is worse to introduce for the case you ever need what it offers. So how to apply the set interval function? Let's just naively put it inside of a reactive statement. The first argument is an anonymous function that displays tick after refresh value from the store seconds. And the interval is the refresh value times 1000 because it's in milliseconds. Now in the browser, I should see that tick for every eight seconds. That would be the educated guess. But it turns out that's not educated enough. If I'm moving the refresh slider here and there, the console messages are getting crazy. Now what's happening in the background? The problem is that the set interval returns with a so-called interval ID. And that ID needs to be used as the argument of the function called clear interval in order to stop the current set interval from calling the function. What I'm doing now is that I call the set interval over and over again without stopping the previous one. So now many set intervals are running simultaneously, but I want to run only one instance at a time. So I create a current ID variable, and whenever this reactive statement is running, it will check first if this current ID has a value. If it does, then clears the corresponding interval. If it doesn't, which should only happen for the very first time, then it will just display no interval has been set yet. And then where does this current ID variable get its value? It will always be equal to the last set interval function's return value. So this is how to start and stop the set interval from running. Checking the browser again, playing around like before with the refresh value. But now before calling a new set interval function, the previous interval gets cleared thanks to their interval IDs and everything seems to be working fine. Let's get a bit more practical and instead of displaying messages on the console, I will create sample sentences and put them in the facts array. I create a get random fact function, which for the first round simply returns with a sentence saying that the random value is a nice number. I will use this function inside of another function called update feed. This will always delete the last element from the facts array and push a new sentence at its beginning. As you might remember, I could use the pop and the unshift array methods for that, but since those are mutable, I replace them with their immutable alternative. So getting rid of the last element first, and then extend the array with a new fact in the beginning like that. And where do I call this update feed function? Inside of the set interval. That's what will replace the console.log there. And one more thing, I'm also going to create an initialize feed function that fills the empty facts array. By the way, I have to initialize this facts array as an empty array. And then this initialize feed will put as many random facts in the fact array as many is required based on the amount value. Here I'm using the unshift method inside of a for loop. And do all these things working great so far? Let's try to decrease the refresh rate and increase the amount value. Now this feed is being filled one by one when the amount value suddenly jumps up. If you prefer to get all the missing sentences immediately, that's easily fixable by using a for loop in the update feed function as well. But I thought this solution fits better. Very good. Two of the three settings options is working fine. There is only one left, the easiest one the button which stops and restarts the feed. A very quick addition before that, when the facts array is still empty in the very beginning, I don't want to fill it with empty strings. So in the reactive statement, which is sensitive to the amount value, I add another condition. 
This should only happen if the fact is not empty, if its length is not zero. As for the start-stop button, there are two things I want to change when the active value turns to false. I want the range inputs to be disabled and the feed not to be updated. The disabled attribute is a boolean value for the input elements, so I can just go to the settings component and say that for these two inputs, I want the disabled attribute to be true if active is false, and false if active is true, so always the opposite of the active value in the store. That's all I need here. And pausing the feed is also not too complicated. I simply call the set interval with a condition if the active value is true. And if the active value is not true, then I don't want the set interval to do anything. So I use the clear interval function with the current ID and set the current ID to null. Now all the three settings have the effect on the feed they are supposed to have. So everything works now with the sample data. And after achieving all this, replacing the sample sentences with sentences fetched from far away, that's basically just a tiny modification compared to what I have done so far. So basically I have two things left to do, a little styling and finding a free API I can fetch fun facts from. I would like to start with the little styling part so that those facts will arrive to a nicely prepared beautiful UI, to a heartwarming welcoming environment. But this is just a personal preference. If you want to start with the API instead, you are free to do so. What I do first is that in the app component, I've wrapped the content of the main section into a div with ID container. And each of these two tags will be wrapped in a div as well. One with ID settings, one with ID feed. Now in the style block, I can grab them and add some styling to them. I start with the main itself. All I want is centering the text inside, horizontally centering the block itself. And I add padding of one EM. EM in CSS is the distance which equals to the text size. The container will have a simple black border and 10 pixels of padding. I picked the so-called ghost white for background color. It's barely visible, but better than nothing. I set a minimum height so that it won't get too short when the amount of the effects is too low. And the display will be set to flex so that I can set the float property in the child element. And that child element is the settings so let's use float here, center. This will have a fancier border with gray color and 10 pixels of border radius, padding of five pixels and the background color this time will be white smoke. And finally, as for the feed div, to keep the content in the middle, margin will be set to zero auto. Okay, in the effect component, I create a style block too, grab the paragraph, and set the font size to large. And finally, I prepared a logo with all my creativity involved, a JPEG file which I put in the public folders, IMG folder, and I want that image to be displayed on the top of the feed component. So I create a logo variable, which will serve as path to this file. Public is the root folder here, so the value will be IMG slash and the file name. And then under the script block, I create an IMG tag, the source attribute equals the logo variables value, and it has to have an alt property too, for the case this logo can't be displayed. I replace these H2s to H4s to make them smaller, and I would say that's all the styling, at least as long as my designing skills remain at the level they are right now. This is what I mean when I talk about beautiful UI. Now the real world fun facts are ready to arrive. All the fun facts will arrive after API calls. Basically the concept is that there is data or resource on a remote server which is written by someone once upon a time and by reaching out to so-called endpoints I'm able to get access to that data. In JavaScript I can use the fetch method for that. Fetch can make asynchronous requests to these resources. Some APIs available out there are not free. Some of them need API keys. I googled for free APIs that are very easy to use and ended up with the CatFacts API. Here are the endpoints I can use. The one I will need is this first one, slash fact, which returns with a random fact. 
I can quickly check that in the browser. I add slash fact to the URL and this would be the object I would like to get. And when I get it, I want to use this fact property. So this is what I can use the fetch method for. There is one argument that is required in order to use the fetch method and that's the URL endpoint specified in the API. So I can call the fetch method inside of the get random fact, hoping that I will get a real cat fact instead of the sample sentence. But as I can see, that is not the case yet. So as I said, the fetch method returns with a promise and those promises, they need time to get resolved, but the browser is not waiting for that. It keeps going to the next task. To change that, I should use the async await syntax, making this function asynchronous and using the await keyword in front of the fetch. Does it work now? No, it doesn't. The response from the server needs to be converted to JSON format to get access to the response body object. And I can use .json for that to the response, but the JSON method returns with a promise as well, instead of the JSON object itself. That means that I need to use another await, this time for the JSON method. And the property of this object that I will need to get a fact is the fact property. So I set the variable this function needs to return with to data.fact. Does this work now? No, it still doesn't. And that's because the get random fact, it's now an asynchronous function and asynchronous functions always return with a promise. So the two functions where I use the get random facts function inside the update feed and the initialize feed, they will be asynchronous as well. And then I can use the await before the get random fact function inside of those two functions. Then I will have the new facts inside of the fact array, just as I did with the sample sentences. Now, if I check the browser, fetching seems to be a long process. I can't see any sentence for a while. And instead of just waiting in front of the blank component, I will display loading or something as long as the fact array is empty. So I write an if statement in the feed component. If the facts length is not zero, let's display this ordered list like I have already done so far. And else, if it's zero, I want a heading saying loading the facts. And end of the if statement. That's the state of the app that you saw in the very beginning of this video. After reaching this point, nothing brand new will come to this tutorial, but I still want to extend this a little bit because what if there are people in the world who prefer to get facts about something else as well, not just cats. Okay, I made a jump cut here. I didn't want to record how I am searching for different free APIs. Now I am storing the different endpoints in an array here in the feed component and always pick one randomly inside of the get random fact function. The logic behind this is very simple. If you want to use it or check it out, the source code for this app is on GitHub. The link is in the description. Thank you for watching this video. I can't promise that I will make a second episode, but it's also not impossible. We'll see. Now let's sit back, relax and enjoy some of the fun facts of the world. Thank you and goodbye.